Good evening. My name is Ricardo Hill, Director of the History Program of the Cuban Cultural Center of New York. Today we are presenting the book Why Cuba Matters by Nestor T. Carbonell. In my opinion, few Cubans have had the innate ability and insight to analyze and expound on our motherland with the conviction of Nestor Carbonell. A proud member of a Cuban patrician family, Mr. Carbonell's patriotic roots grow deep and wide and even touch our apostle Jose Martí. At the end of the 19th century, Martí found in the author's great-grandfather, Nestor Leonero Carbonell y Figueroa, who lived in exile in Tampa, a truly close friend, collaborator, and enthusiastic patriot, always willing to help. After 1902, Nestor Leonero Carbonell's three sons, Jose Manuel, Nestor, and Miguel Angel, who were now in Cuba free from Spain, dedicated much of their time to disseminate Martí's writings in the island, as well as full significance of Martí's dimension and legacy. As early as 1904, José Manuel Carbonell gave a series of lectures at the Liceo de Guanabacoa, while the brother Nestor was doing the same at the Ateneo de la Habana, as well as publishing two books, Martí, Poeta y Escritor, and Martí, Su Vida y Su Obra. Miguel Ángel, the youngest of the Carbonell brothers, published Ruta del Fundador and Evocando al Maestro. The author's great uncle, Eligio Carbonell, who died in the wake of the founding of the Republic, collaborated with Martí in real time, promoting emancipation activities and corresponding extensively with him. As a delegate in Tampa, Eligio was signatory to the chart that established the Cuban Revolutionary Party and later collaborated with Gonzalo de Quesada Arostegui, depository of the literary testament of José Martí. In 1930, José Manuel Carbonell, the author's paternal grandfather, a diplomat, presided over the Cuban Academy of Arts and Letters, while José Manuel Cortina, the author's maternal grandfather, was a participant in Cuba's 1940 Constitutional Convention. Raúl de Cárdenas, the author's wife's grandfather, was vice president of Cuba from 1944 to 1948, the constitutional period. And Nestor Carbonell Andricaín, the author's father, was speaker of the House of Representatives from 1940 to 1942. And now for a very biographical portrait of the author himself, it is my pleasure to share with you this brief video clip. This is the story of an extraordinary man who has lived an extraordinary life. It is the story of Nestor Carbonell. The great skill of Nestor is to get you to think that you volunteer to do something that he's really maneuvered you into doing. Definitely belongs at the United Nations. <laughs> He's the only ambassador that we've ever had and I suspect we ever will have. Ambassador Carbonell, definitely. He's a very special person. He has such a powerful and optimistic energy which makes us believe that everything is possible. You couldn't help feeling better about PepsiCo when Nestor was around. He is a true, true, exceptional human being. Our 
Our story begins in Havana, Cuba. It is 1936. Nestor Carbonell is born into a family of prominent Cuban patriots and statesmen. Nestor's father is a congressman in Cuba, and his mother raises Nestico along with his sister Marta. He leads a life of sports and clubs and attends boarding school in Palm Beach, Florida. He graduates cum laude. Nestor returns to Havana for college, where he studies law and excels in debates, then attends Harvard and earns a Master of Law degree. In 1958, he returns to Cuba. The following year, he denounces Fidel Castro's communist takeover in newspaper articles and in speeches. He is detained by Castro's police force and placed under surveillance. Nestor trains as a freedom fighter in a secret military camp in the jungles of Guatemala and becomes part of the Bay of Pigs invasion in 1961. Just as Nestor's boat is ready to strike, it is called back. The beachhead has already fallen into the hands of Castro forces. At the age of 26, Nesto represents anti-Castro groups before the OAS and U.S. Congress. He alerts leaders of both parties about a covert Soviet military presence in Cuba, a buildup which would soon lead to the Cuban Missile Crisis. Unmistakable evidence. Nesto realizes that the liberation of Cuba is not feasible at this time. He settles in New York in 1965. After settling in New York. Our invited guest had a long and illustrious career as one of the leader, leading executives of PepsiCo, taking him to different countries around the world. Since then, he has devoted his time to writing and actively advocating for a solution to Cuba's plight, publishing books and articles on Cuban affairs, history, and constitutional law. Nestor Carbonell has excelled in international public affairs and as a business leader with over 40 years of experience working in Latin America, Europe, India, and China. He is an accomplished public speaker and has addressed many international forums. In fact, Pursuing an independent, active diplomacy has been his trademark, recognized not only by his peers, but by leading personalities around the world. It is an honor to present to you Nestor T. Carbonell, who will now share with us his new book, Why Cuba Matters. Thank you, Ricardo for your very generous and thoughtful introduction and for your kind references to my ancestors. I hope that my remarks tonight will live up to the high expectations you have raised. Many thanks to the Cuban Cultural Center of New York led by Iraida Iturralde, for inviting me to present my latest book, Why Cuba Matters, New Threats in America's Backyard. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Muy buenas noches to all those who are joining us tonight. Now, I'm aware that our attention these days is centered on the pandemic and on the highly contentious 2020 election. But we cannot close our eyes to external challenges and threats to our national security, including those that are looming close to our shores. Hence, the alert of my book, a vivid, in-depth history of the 60-plus year Castro communist regime, which describes how the Castro brothers 
and their cohorts deceived and subjugated the Cuban people, defied 12 U.S. presidents, and continue to jeopardize peace and security in the Americas. Not single-handedly, but in collusion with Russia, China, Venezuela, Nicaragua, and other rogue states and narco-terrorist organizations. Sadly, even foreign affairs experts who should know better seem to forget the outsized geopolitical importance of an island smaller than the state of Pennsylvania. Sitting astride the so-called American Mediterranean, Cuba dominates the main entrances to the Gulf of Mexico. It commands the Caribbean Sea and the Atlantic approaches to the Panama Canal, and it lies 90 miles from the United States. Not surprisingly, colonial Spain fought long and hard to keep the island it called bulwark of the Indies and key to the New World. Cuba was also the epicenter of the Spanish-American War. And during World War II's Battle of the Atlantic, Nazi submarines around Cuba ravaged Allied supply chains until the U.S. finally counterattacked. Despite these facts, it is fair to acknowledge that Washington consistently underestimated Moscow's strategic interest in Cuba during the Cold War. Let's take the Bay of Pigs invasion as an example. Kennedy told the chiefs of the anti-Castro brigade that he canceled the vital air cover to avoid a confrontation with Moscow over Berlin. But that decision only emboldened Khrushchev to build the Berlin Wall and trigger the Cuban Missile Crisis. This is how the Soviet Premier thrashed President Kennedy at the June 1961 Vienna summit, shortly after the Bay of Pigs invasion. When James Reston of the New York Times asked Kennedy how it had gone with Khrushchev, the president replied, and I quote, worst thing in my life, he savaged me. Because of the Bay of Pigs disaster, Khrushchev thought that anyone who was so young and inexperienced as to get into that mess could be taken, and anyone who got into it and didn't see it through had no guts. So he just beat the hell out of me. I've got a terrible problem." End of quote. One year later, the Kennedy administration reiterated that the Soviet military buildup that was going on in Cuba was only defensive. And he dismissed the early warnings of the CIA director John McCone, 
of several well-informed senators and of the Cuban underground. U.S. reconnaissance flights over Cuba were even suspended for nearly one month. When the White House finally woke up in October 1962 with photographic evidence, Moscow already had in Cuba 42 medium-range nuclear missiles mostly installed and protected by some 40,000 Soviet military personnel. As you know, that led to the Cuban Missile Crisis. Following an awesome U.S. air and naval blockade of the island, backed by our allies, the Soviets withdrew the missiles from Cuba without provoking a nuclear confrontation. That was great, but the crisis didn't really end there. Moscow was able to turn the island of Cuba into a launch pad for aggression and subversion throughout Latin America, Africa, and other regions for nearly 30 years. At the end of the Cold War, Many thought that the Castro regime no longer posed a threat to the region. So, to foster a new beginning in 2014, the Obama administration restored diplomatic relations with Castro's Cuba, removed it from the list of state sponsors of terrorism and eased restrictions on travel, trade, banking, and investments. For a while, the rapprochement seemed to be working. Raul Castro cordially greeted Obama in Havana. They both enjoyed a baseball game and did the wave, and thousands of American visitors traveled to Cuba and relished its mojitos, salsa, and colorful vintage cars. But at the same time, detentions and poundings of peaceful dissidents increased to nearly 10,000 in 2016. And the licensing of many private enterprises, such as in-home restaurants and bread and breakfast, which had been growing very fast, were abruptly suspended by the government for more than one year. But what shook the U.S. and ended the mirage called fall occurred in late 2016 through all of 2017. At least 26 American diplomats and intelligence officers based in Havana suffered mysterious injuries to widespread brain networks. They had to be taken out of Cuba to undergo extended medical treatment in the U.S. Similar symptoms were experienced by 15 American officers in China and 14 Canadian in Havana. Conclusive reports are still pending. 
but the findings so far indicate that these were targeted attacks, possibly using high-intensity microwave beams. The suspected perpetrator in cahoots with the Castro regime seems to be Russia, which during the Cold War sought to weaponize radiation. In addition, the Castro regime continued to harbor a large number of fugitives and terrorists from the United States and other countries. The regime also intensified its support of the Maduro dictatorship in Venezuela with thousands of Cuban spies, paramilitary personnel, and repression thugs. Here's an important quote. According to the Secretary General of the Organization of American States. Cuban agents in Venezuela exceed 15,000. It's like an occupation army, the secretary told U.S. Congress. A virtual army involved in torture and extrajudicial killings characterized last month by the UN as crimes against humanity. But what aggravates the overall situation in the region even more is the penetration of Russia and China. A few examples. In February 2014, just when Russia was poised to take over Crimea, Moscow's intelligence gathering ship, Viktor Leonov, docked in Havana. That ship has since visited the island several times not for tourism, I can assure you. In October 2015, one of Russia's spy ships with submersible craft targeting vital undersea cables that carry the lifeblood of global internet communications headed to Cuba where, according to the Pentagon, a major cable lands near the American naval base of Guantanamo. Venezuela is also a Russian high priority. Apart from selling to Chavez and Maduro more than $11 billion in military equipment, Putin deployed nuclear-capable bombers in 2018 to carry out drills over the Caribbean. He also sent to Caracas in 2019 military supplies and mercenaries who stayed there. China also has shown great economic and strategic interest in this hemisphere. Over the last decade, Beijing issued billions of dollars, with a B, billions of dollars in commodities-backed loans, mainly to leftist authoritarian governments in Latin America. Venezuela got more than $60 billion ahead of oil shipments. The China loans, generally difficult to pay back, 
fall within its worldwide Belt and Road Initiative, designed to create dependence on Beijing as a prelude to global supremacy. 17 Latin American governments have already been enticed by the Belt and Road predatory loans, according to U.S. Southern Command. China is also enhancing its cyber and intelligence capability in Latin America. Beijing's military built and are operating in Patagonia, Argentina, a satellite and space station which, according to the Pentagon, could compromise U.S. intelligence networks. And in Cuba, they are covertly using an electronic spy base in Bejucal, near Havana. Now, the big question. Given the Russian and Chinese advances in Latin America, did any U.S. strategist with authority sound the alarm? Yes. Four-star Admiral Kurt W. Tidd, head of U.S. Southern Command. This is what he told the Senate Armed Services Committee on February 15, 2018, before he retired. And I quote, There is a perception among our friends and the palpable anticipation among our competitors that we no longer stand by our commitments, that we are relinquishing our strategic position in Latin America, and that we don't take the challenge in the region seriously. End of quote. The Admiral pointed out the threats that China, Russia, and Iran could pose to the region if not deterred. He also asserted that the Castro regime was propping up the Maduro dictatorship with intelligence service and armed forces. Thanks largely to Admiral Tidd's clarion call, reinforced by his successor, Admiral Fowler, the U.S., Canada, and more than 50 Latin American and European governments denounced Maduro's fraudulent re-election in 2019 and recognized Juan Guaido as legitimate interim president of Venezuela. But that's not enough to resolve the situation. To achieve a democratic transition in Venezuela, currently blocked by Maduro, coordinated actions under the aegis of the OAS may be required, involving both diplomacy and stronger collective pressure, backed by an inter-American peace force offering guarantees to key players. On a broader scale, we need a comprehensive, forward-looking U.S. strategy to address urgent political, economic, 
and security challenges in Latin America. Absent U.S. leadership in this hemisphere, Russia and China would fill the void and eventually threaten our national security. And finally, what about Cuba? Although there is no end in sight, opportunities for change may arise when Raul Castro, now 89, and other aged diehards of the Politburo are gone, provided the U.S. does not bail out or grant unilateral concessions to the regime without quid pro quo. Cuba is facing today a dire situation with severe shortages of food and power. The only thing that seems to be working is the police state apparatus. But absent systemic reforms, repression won't be able to quell growing demands for a true democratic opening. This may take time, but it will come. The Castro regime is waning. It's wrought pervasive. Its resources wasted. Its mystique exhausted. But the yearning for freedom has not vanished in Cuba. It beats strongly, particularly in the hearts of the restless young generations pressing for change. Cuba's foremost hero, José Martí, who led the final war of independence in the Americas, put it very eloquently. He said, liberty never dies from the cuts it receives. The dagger that wounds it carries in its veins new blood. Cuba's new blood today is mainly represented by the brave pro-democracy and human rights activists on the island who are at the forefront of the struggle for freedom. They should be encouraged and supported as were the leaders of solidarity movement in Poland. For they are the hope of the hopeless and the power of the powerless and they shall eventually prevail. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nestor for such a brilliant and inspiring exposition, which I am sure will give way to a very engaging dialogue in the Q&A that we now plan to have with our audience. Those of you who are interested in joining us, please click on the link that we have given you in the chat session to the right of your screen. See you soon.